Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this first breakout session dedicated to the uh, 2023 annual review of employment and social developments in Europe, ESDE for short. We're going to be talking about ESD uh, a few times throughout the day, so I mean, you might as well memorize that. Um, this year's report sheds a very specific light on labor shortages and skill ga skills gaps in the EU. Uh, by the way, the report is available online. There is a very nice dedicated website, so if you want to look it up online rather than picking up a paper copy, or at the same time as picking up a paper copy, um, just look for ESDE. Review 2023. In any search engine, you will find it, ESDE Review 2023. Welcome to those of you who are following us online as well. Um, all of you, whether online or in the room, if you would like to comment on our discussion this morning and if you'd like to promote the, some of the arguments or some of the points that are going to be made, you're very welcome to do so on social media using the hashtag EUSocialForum, as you have hopefully been doing since yesterday. You will also have the opportunity to ask some questions to our speakers. You can do so online via the chat function of your platform. So don't hesitate, please. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. And of course, in the room, we're going to have uh, hostesses walking around with a mic. So you're very welcome to raise your questions towards the end of our discussion. We will have today two sessions dedicated to the review. The second one, which will take place this afternoon, uh, will focus on specific aspects of the report with two of its co-authors. But this morning's session will zoom in on the impact of the twin transition, you know, the, the digital and green transition, and on aging population. We will also look a little more closely at the specific skills that are needed in occupations and sectors that are subject to shortages, and sometimes uh, very important shortages. Um, but we'll also focus on how working conditions contribute to those shortages. So before we set the scene on our discussion, we'd like to hear from you, uh, whether in the room or online. The time has come to pull out your phone and connect to slido.com. So slido.com on your phone and hashtag EU social forum, as uh, we have already mentioned, we have a question for you. In one word, what do you think is the main reason behind those shortages? And actually, it says in one word, but we'll extend it to two, maybe three. I'm just thinking of things like if, if you think it is lack of skills, that's three words, but yes, that's acceptable. Or it can be human resources, or, so it can be up to three short words. But please answer that question on Slido. We will come back to the result of that particular poll in a few minutes. But before we do so, we're going to set the scene. And in the context of the European Year of Skills, the findings of the report are particularly timely, obviously. So to help us put things in the right context, uh, and present some of those key findings, I would like to invite our keynote speaker for this morning. Please welcome Ms. Barbara Kaufmann, who's Director for Employment and Social Governance at the European Commission. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming, either here uh, to the Egg in Brussels or online. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to present uh, to you the ESDE, and indeed I also invite you to, to look at the report itself. It's actually a very uh, rich uh, source of uh, analysis, information, and uh, I'm afraid I might have a, a few too many slides, so I will try to 
go as fast and easy as possible. Um, uh, basically, when we started to discuss uh, um, the topic for this year, because every year nowadays for the ESTA report, we have an overarching topic, and we felt that uh, labor shortages and skill shortages has really uh, gained Im importance. Uh, 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 it has been rising uh, for a decade, and uh, also we hear increasingly complaints from member states, from social partners, especially the business side, that uh, labor and skills shortages are a major stumbling block to expanding business, um, to, to economic growth in general. And, and for us, it's also a very big concern in terms of the rollout of the green digital transition. So um, basically, we wanted to look uh, in this report at the structural drivers and then also at some of the measures that can be taken in order to respond to, uh, to uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, now, uh, as was already mentioned, of course, this also um, is particularly re relevant in the European year of um, of skills. So I want to briefly uh, talk about the main employment social developments because we always have that chapter one, which is also in line with our reporting uh, duties to Parliament and Council about recent employment and social trends, and then uh, uh, for, uh, focus on, 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 on the labor shortages and the other two. Uh, sections. So, uh, when it comes to uh, the economy, employment, social developments, uh, we have to say that the economy, but especially the labor market, have been quite resilient in the light of the two crises that we've had, COVID pandemic, then Russia's war against Ukraine, and its impact in terms of energy and inflation. Uh, so, uh, basically, what we have seen last year, that we still had GDP growth of 3.5%. Uh, now, since the last quarter of last year, fourth quarter, we have seen some clear uh, slowdown on, on the growth side. And uh, uh, this week, uh, the new autumn forecast has come out. It predicts only 0.6% growth, uh, growth this year, then 1.3% in 2024 and 1.7% in 25. So clearly now some sluggish growth, but some pick up. And against this background, on the other hand, the labor market has been really remarkably resilient. Uh, we have had a, a record employment rate last year, 74.6%. Uh, the second quarter this year, 75.4%. You might know that the EU has set itself a target of 78% employment rate by 2030. And so we are really uh, uh, going faster than expected in this direction, 200 and 16 million people uh, employed in the EU right now is a record uh, number. Then on the other hand, the unemployment rate has been, rate has been steadily uh, declining. And here, uh, basically last year, the average was 6.2%. Now we see numbers, I mean, the lowest we have seen in one month was 5.9. We see roughly 6%. And it's projected that this kind of low unemployment, really very low unemployment rate is stabilizing. Uh, we see some moderate uh, um employment uh, growth going forward. That's the green line, I think. I think that perhaps even the labor shortages are one of these factors, maybe also increasing wage uh, uh, rises, but uh, are a factor that explain why now employment growth uh, becomes a bit sluggish, but still from this high level. Now, uh, Coming uh, already for the first time to the is issue of labor shortages. I mentioned already they've been rising for a, d a decade. We had sort of a, a blip uh, going down during COVID and then uh, record levels uh, where the vacancy uh, rate uh, reached 2.9% uh, in the EU and even 3.1% in the euro area. And uh, 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 if you see the slides again, I don't know, there's no signal right now, then you would see that they're quite some huge differences when it comes to vacancy rates between different member states. And uh, on the other <laughs> right-hand side of the slide, you would have seen the so-called beverage curve, uh, which um, basically shows that we have had a, really a huge increase in these vacancy rates. Um, I think uh, two days ago, I was at another uh, event uh, dealing with the energy sector, for instance. Uh, the energy sector, I think since, since 2007, 17 had tripled, while uh, in the economy uh, uh, it has doubled uh, since then. So um, let's then go to the poverty. And here, um, uh, what you would see is a relatively 
stable situation of the at risk of poverty rate where there has been as at first some significant decline since 2015, but then the last year some sort of a stabilization and the only uh, uh, sort of uh, deterioration we have seen is actually in the social deprivation rate where in 20, from 21 to 22 uh, uh, the uh, rate has increased from 6.3 to 6.7 percent. In a way, um, so uh, here you see still on the right hand side the, the curve that shows how uh, job vacancy is getting higher and higher on the left upper hand while the unemployment rates are going down as well as the uh, um, differences uh, between member states. So I was already at the next slide and um, uh, then uh, it would be good that we get there. <laughs> hmm? There's a problem. So I don't know. So, uh, okay, let me just say that uh, in terms of poverty, I already mentioned that uh, in a way, considering the crisis that we've had, uh, maybe I should get this thing, um, uh, but in terms of the crisis that we've mm -hmm. had, we should have actually ex almost expected a sharper rise in the risk of poverty or other um, uh, indicators, but I think that uh, it, it was clear that the various measures that have been taken at the member states level in particular, but also at the EU level and the fiscal stabilizers have uh, played an important role. Nevertheless, nevertheless, because of the high inflation as a result of uh, uh, Russia's war against Ukraine, uh, we have seen a decline in the real purchasing power of households. And in fact, we have seen a three and a half percent decline in wages, in real wages last year. And so uh, uh, that's what you see on the blue sign uh, on the right side. This is the real disposable household income where uh, in um, 2022 um, there was a slight decline but what is sort of uh, positive that uh, recently in 2023 you see a pickup in terms of uh, gross real gross disposable household incomes. So that ends the first part, the more uh, employment and social developments, and then we move to the labor uh, shortages. Uh, uh, first uh, uh, into the drivers, you see here uh, the key elements that we have put there, demographic change, green and digital transitions, but then also under-representation on the labor market and working conditions. And uh, I think that uh, there's just one slide that I want to show you briefly where you see some of the shortage occupations. We have used data from the uh, European Labor Authority, from Business and Consumer service, uh, Survey of our colleagues from DG Economic and Financial Affairs, and then also job, uh, job vacancy rates. And uh, so here you see some uh, persistent labor shortage. So th this is, in some cases, you might find a bit of a cyclical phenomenon, but this is something where there's really some uh, persistence. But now going back to these various sectors that I mentioned and starting with the demography, um, uh, I think it's quite striking what you see there uh, in terms of uh, after having reached a record of 272 million people in 2009 for the working age population. Uh, now uh, we have seen already declined by 7 million uh, by, uh, uh, to, to reach 265 million in 2022. This is expected to go down further to 258 million by 2030 and then further to 236 million by 2050. So you see there is this huge decline going on which is roughly uh, almost 1 million uh, per year. And that uh, if you assume that the activity rates stay where they are, uh, which is not what we hope, but if this is assumed, then also uh, the uh the number of active uh, people will be declining uh, from a record 205 million down to around 200 million to 2030 and 184 million in 2050. So it shows to you we don't only see right now an issue of labor shortages, but it will get worse because on the labor supply side, there are fewer and fewer people with many going, of course, in retirement. I didn't even say that. Now let's look then a bit at the demand side. And there, indeed, we have as, as key drivers the green and the digital transition because we expect that these uh, transformations will create more jobs. Of course, we all know that 
that there's some jobs that will be lost in some sectors, but overall, in net terms, it's expected that there will be more jobs. For instance, also in 2019, when uh, the Green Deal was launched, uh, uh, in the impact assessment, the number quoted was uh, net, in net terms, we will have one million more jobs by 2030, and I think it was even two million by 2050. In the meantime, we have had also some other numbers. 2.5 million could be the extra uh, creation of jobs, and I don't hide that we are not yet totally firm in terms of numbers. We have also invited the EU agencies, uh, CETEFOB, uh, Eurofound, uh, or the Joint Research Institute, one of our DGs, to uh, try to update uh, some of these uh, uh, employment employment impacts from the green transition, and obviously something like the Net Zero um, uh, Act uh, with the aim to create more manufacturing capacity for Net Zero technologies is expected to create more jobs, about half a million. Uh, so this is sort of, on the one hand, fewer people in the labor market, on the other hand, more jobs, more needs. And this is not only about more people, but it's especially also about more skills, because there are a lot of new skills that will be required in the context of the green transition. Looking briefly at the digital transition, also here we see in the past there has been a constant demand for workers in digital occupations that has increased. You also see that the women, uh, the bottom line, represent a lower share in this uh, than the men. That's, of course, one of our, our issues, and we can expect that this kind of increase uh, will continue. And uh, when in 22 we had 9 million uh, ICT specialists, there's some EU target as part of the digital decade that talks about more than doubling to reach 20 million by 2030. So a lot of skilling required. Uh, uh, then um, uh, it's also uh, has to be said that apart from the ICT uh, kind of jobs and, and skills needs, uh, there is also a major challenge in the sense that uh, we know that 90% of the jobs in the EU nowadays require basic digital skills, but what we have in terms of uh, people is more around 53%. There is a target that again by 2030 we should have 80% uh, of people um, in the labor force having these uh, basic digital skills. Um, then. Um, I come to the next topic, and the next topic is sort of uh, um, the uh, lower labor market participation of some groups. And uh, you see the EU average, and then you also see that there are some differences in employment rates. Let me, for instance, say lower, uh, it's 62% it's for older workers, for lower uh, people with secondary or lower education, 63%, for women, 69%, while we have an average of 76% without mentioning the latest number, which is above 75%. So you see there are huge... Uh, Possibilities. I'm not. I mean, of course, even for for men or average workers, there are still there are still possibilities for more people to work. But especially in this underrepresented group, uh, for women, for instance, we calculated that there could be around 70, 17 uh, million more uh, active uh, people if 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 the women uh, would increase their 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 activity rate to to something that uh, we can see for men. Or there's also uh, 11 and 13 million respectively for secondary educated and older people. Uh, uh, so I think this is some uh, reservoir we have to keep in mind here, some pool. Um, and uh, of course, when it comes to women, we see that uh, they tend to go often in, in different uh, occupations uh, than men. Uh, so we have a certain uh, gender uh, segregation uh, that distorts the labor supply. And uh, we can say that most occupations that face persistent labor shortages are either dominated by men or by women. Uh, and it's only 14% of the shortage uh, occupations that uh, are gender balanced, which shows that if you have, want to overcome that, you really have to work on these uh, stereotypes and improve the situation, uh, especially, I mean, in many cases for women, where we also know that there's a lower pay. Um, so then uh, coming to another uh, driver, uh, that's the working conditions. And uh, here uh, we can say that uh, poor working conditions do also explain the persistence of labor shortages in some occupations and sectors. I think here we have uh, actually sectors that are uh, 
uh, shortage occupations, exactly. And then depending on the sector, uh, there is more or less um, uh, a problem of jobs uh, strain. This kind of data came uh, from uh, Eurofound and, and uh, basically uh, shows uh, different dimensions of job quality, including work environment, organization time, and job prospects, and then looking at different uh, sectors. And here it turns out that, for instance, workers in healthcare, uh, residential care, uh, transport workers, uh, nurses, carers, drivers, all these are uh, areas where job quality um, uh, on strain in the job is quite important. Uh, on the right side, you see one where the red is a bit missing. That's the ICT. They don't seem to have that problem. Um, I would also like to say that often when we talk about working conditions, uh, pay is also included as one of the factors. And of course, also here we know that uh, in quite a few of the uh, uh, shortage sectors, uh, there's low pay when you think, for instance, about cleaners or home care, but I don't want to uh, go more into detail. And instead, uh, let's go then to the um, uh, second part of, 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 of this presentation, which is just to talk a little bit about the policy uh, measures to address labor and skills shortages, a long list that I will not read here, but rather than uh, go to uh, the different aspects. So starting with activation, um, I already mentioned the unused labor potential, market potential just now. And of course here an important aspect is to reach out to the underrepresented groups, be also more targeted in the past and really, you know, long time un uh, term, term unemployed, the youth, you have to uh, address them in different ways to get them into, um, into the uh, labor market. And uh, uh, there, uh, I think it's also important to say that by um, integrating people in the labor market, you also, to some extent, move towards the other aim that we have at the EU level, which is to reduce poverty. Because, of course, uh, even though it's not guaranteed that you, uh, if you have a job, uh, you are out of poverty, uh, the chances are much higher than you are. Um, so um, there are issues like job assistance, job search assistance, there are sometimes hiring and wage subsidies. We also have this as part of our recommendation on ensuring that the green transition is fair, so that particularly in this area, one could provide for some hiring uh, support to move people there, uh, support to entrepreneurship. And I, uh, for instance, yesterday we also heard that, for instance, uh, I mean, the head of the German PES, Public Employment Service was saying that they were increasingly now working uh, with artificial intelligence to try to improve their service to the clients. So, uh, you know, there are really some efforts going on. And I would also say that I have the impression uh, that uh, companies are also becoming increasingly active to find these uh, workers. So it's not only something that is done at the public level. Um, then, um, of course, next to that, uh, trying to get people in is, is is important, extremely important, but also on the side there are other things that can play a role. Role, For instance, taxes can play a role, and so there are some simulations in the ESTA that show that uh, income tax credits uh, with preferential treatments for those with lower incomes can lead to uh, uh, higher increases in the labor market than if you would uh, spread these uh, in income tax credits across the board. Uh, also, when you focus on people with uh, lower, or with prime primary education, for instance, you get also uh, much better uh, uh, results. So this targeted approach is important. And uh, similarly, I also wanted to mention that, of course, and a big issue is also uh, childcare uh, uh, services. And there we also have uh, uh, something, uh, you know, the ESSEX early Childcare, whatever um, it's the abbreviation for that, and we can show that if uh, if some if that is improved, uh, for instance, to the Barcelona target of 45 percent, then you see uh, an increase in um, uh, employment participation of mothers. So um, also in this whole broad area in terms of active employment support, the EU has uh, undertaken various uh, measures, recommendation that I just mentioned on ensuring fair transition, uh, commission recommendation, effective active employment support. Um, uh, the PES network is working on various approaches. And then, of course, we also have a council recommendation on integrating long-term unemployed into the labor market. Uh, there is a youth guarantee. I cannot mention them all. 
And then let me just go into the skills part. Also, I know there's also a, a panel this afternoon, so I will not go too deeply into it. Then here, of course, there are major upskilling and reskilling measures uh, needed to improve the matching of labor supply and demand. And, uh, and uh, here, um, vocational uh, training programs in Lithuania, as an example, you can find in the report, uh, have shown to, to have a positive employment effect, particularly uh, for some underrepresented groups, such as women over 50 or uh, participants with lower skills levels. Um, I think more generally, we are looking more and more at granular data, also using administrative data. We have a project together with the OECD in trying to see the effectiveness of specific policies for specific groups, and I think that improves uh, the evidence base for policymakers to, uh, to be more targeted in, in, in their approaches. Um, uh, of course, um, I um, then uh, would say that also when it comes to the skills mismatches, uh, we have uh, shown with some modeling that if you improve the skills matching by one percentage point at the regional level, then uh, you will also see positive macroeconomic effects for all regions, uh, uh, what you can see on the chart. Some are doing particularly well, such as Spain in this particular case. The overarching framework we have is the European Skills Agenda. It has 12 flagship actions. I cannot mention them all. One I find particularly important, but they are all important is the EU Pact for Skills. Uh, by now, there have been uh, developed 18 sectoral partnerships. Uh, they bring together for a specific area, let's say batteries or, or, or uh, uh, solar or something like that. They bring together education providers, governance, businesses, workers, and then for this specific area, they say, we need so many workers in the next three years. This is the money they will provide it for that. And I think it's, it, it's, it's quite concrete. Of course, we have also skills intelligence to better understand the future labor market needs so that basic education, vocational education, university is all more targeted to these needs. We have individual learning accounts, micro-credentials that allow people, I mean, these are recommendations to member states, to be precise, where uh, then in the future, uh, uh, workers might be more easily take a training course for two months when they know it's recognized, uh, it's worth it, uh, than if you don't do it. Uh, and in the context of the Net Zero uh, Industry Act, uh, uh, it has also been decided that skills ac academies would be set up. That is, of course, then in the context of the rollout of Europe's manufacturing industry for the net zero industries. Um, then I come to the improvement of working conditions. Well, it is difficult. I have a list with some things. I will not go through all of them, but of course, a key issue is to make uh, uh, working conditions more attractive. I, I, I put the EU level there. There is a national level, and I think uh, okay, it says now sectoral level, but actually I think social partners also play a very important role in this context. Um, so uh, uh, just to mention a few things at the EU level, we have now this um, uh, minimum wage directive or the EU framework, which will be, have to be transposed in one year in November uh, uh, after it was previously adopted and discussions have been going on. We have a work-life balance directive. There is a, a, okay, a occupational health and safety um, strategy, and, uh, and of course there are many other things, considerations in terms of also flexible work arrangements, but uh, I would say that that's not exactly now what, what is one of our recommendations. Uh, recently an ongoing uh, discussion is on the platform uh, directive. Uh, um, there we are in the trilogues and there one of the key questions is that uh, workers and the Commissioner Schmidt yesterday mentioned that also workers that uh, have to work, uh, you know, with algorithms, sometimes they don't even know what is behind the algorithms, also they influence what they, their working conditions and their pay, uh, that they will have uh, better access to information, uh, they had the possibility to speak to people about this and so on. And uh, I would say that, uh, of course, the rollout of artificial intelligence, we heard a lot about that uh, yesterday, raises all sorts of new questions that I cannot solve here, and I'm not claiming that the report is solving. Uh, but uh, in any case, um, 
I think uh, I, I, I stop there, but uh, maybe as last element, I might mention the European care strategy. It is a ra rather recent strategy, but also sheds the light on the working conditions in, in, in the care sector, as well as the service needs in the care sector and the shortages. Uh, now, what I've not mentioned so much on the driver side, but I want to mention on the solution side that Apart from addressing all the other issues that I mentioned, of course, we also know that migration can complement the other solutions in terms of activation, in terms of up and reskilling, in terms of um, um, working conditions. And, uh, and, and here, uh, the idea is that there could be targeted labor migration uh, to uh, help uh, reduce labor shortages. To some extent, this is already the case, of course. And uh, what we know is that currently, uh, migrant workers have actually a higher uh, share in shortage sectors than others, or they are more likely to be employed in these shortage sectors. Uh, then, of course, they have, uh, in the end, uh, um, uh, language skills, difficulties uh, in terms of formal uh, qualifications that should be recognized, some uh, discrimination care uh, responsibilities. And now that we are at this major challenge in terms of how to meet our labor shortages, uh, um, it's increasingly important to help uh, uh, those uh, people to come to the EU to, uh, to also have the right uh, conditions. One of the uh, initiatives that was launched uh, on Wednesday is the EU Skills Talent Mobility Package, uh, uh, which establishes a talent pool and will help companies attract uh, people with the right skills and also will provide a platform to match job seekers uh, with EU-wide uh, 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 sh shortage uh, occupations. Um, so. Um, I'm then almost at the end, but I want to uh, come back to the issue of uh, the important role of social partners in all these aspects that I've just uh, mentioned. And uh, I think uh, in training, they have been already to some extent uh, uh, involved. Uh, I mean, this is now just one aspect, but I have the impression in, in recent uh, events and so on that I think also uh, there's such a pressure on the skills formation that there's even even more uh, uh, interest in um, on, on the business side to also uh, develop their own training. Also, that's easier for the bigger companies and much more difficult for the smaller where then some uh, co cooperation is needed. And then, of course, for, for, for working conditions, uh, social partners play a key role, integration of migrants, there's some agreement also, and... Uh, and so on. Uh, so I think um, uh, I, I think you probably know that the EU actively supports uh, social dialogue. Uh, there has been recently a council recommendation to strengthen social dialogue in the EU and uh, to better involve social partners in policy design and the help uh, of uh, further capacity. So the last slide is just showing a bit of an overview of the different kind of aspects that we have. Uh, I don't know whether you can really read it. It looks pretty small to me in some cases, but anyway, um, maybe the last thing that uh, I just mentioned without going much into detail, you see some EU funding um, that plays a key role, for instance, in skilling, it's 10 billion if you add together ESF Plus, uh, Recover and Resilience Facility, Just Transition Fund for up to 2027. And uh, I think um, now I can only, uh, first of all, say that I'm looking forward uh, to the panel discussion. And I invite you to look at um, the report as well as the new interactive platform, which uh, is the first time for this year. And let me also say a big thanks to Lucas and, uh, and Katharina, who manage uh, this report uh, uh, as part of Teach Employment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. And Barbara is going to stay with us for the Q&A session. So if you have any specific question uh, to ask her, she will be around. Now let's have a look at the outcome of our Slido poll. So one word, well, we've got two uh, very obvious winners there, skills and working conditions. Many other satellite uh, words, I would say, but it's just so striking that these two are 
to your mind, to the mind of our viewers online as well, the two most obvious elements. I will invite our speakers to actually uh, maybe highlight those <laughs> results in their, in their various comments. And um, to do so, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this morning. So we have with us Sara de la Rica, who's from the University of the Basque Country and ISEAC Research Center. Next to her is Mark Keyes, who's head of division on skills and employability at the OECD. Uh, next to Mark is Esther Lynch, Secretary General of the European uh, Trade Union Confederation. And at the end of our panel is Maxime Cerruti, who's the Director for Social Affairs at Business Europe. Welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I will invite you throughout the uh, exchanges to bounce off each other. Don't hesitate to sort of, you know, signal, raise your hand or something if you'd like to intervene at some point. It's much nicer for all of you, but also for our audience if you have a bit of an interactive exchange rather than, you know, just uh, uh, Q&A between us. So, um, Sarah, I, I will start with you. I mean, we, we've just had a very comprehensive overview of the report uh, from Barbara, and, and the report does discuss uh, a number of drivers of, of persistent labors and, and skill shortages. You have seen the report. Do you think that the drivers that are highlighted in the report are the, the, the ones that seem the most obvious to you, or would you maybe add some based on your, uh, on your experience and, uh, and expertise? and at the same time, if you'd like to comment on the outcome, because in the meantime, there's a third one that has come up, <laughs> which is demographic change. So some people were probably still answering. Uh, so, and, and demographic change was also mentioned by Barbara. So um, besides those three, and uh, you know, what, what are, in your view, the most striking drivers? Yeah, well, thanks a lot for being here. It's a, really a pleasure to be. And it has been a pleasure to read the report, because given that we had to discuss it, uh, I had to read it. <laughs> and it was really nice to invest some time uh, having a look at that. Um, I would say, you know, when I looked at, at, at uh, that and seeing that skills and working conditions were the two most highlighted. I was worried about nobody saying demographic change. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, now I see mm -hmm. that they that, that you all of you have said that. For me, skills is the most important thing. I mean, uh, um, the two transitions are, are really, really imposing as challenges with regards to uh, new skills, uh, and that is just you know as we have been uh, listening yesterday all the time. It's uh, uh, now with automation and with uh, um, uh, uh, um, in, in, uh, uh, intelligence, um, now we'll have to do, humans ha will have to do new tasks. And that's really a change that we've been seeing for the last 10 years, but that's going to be more probably quicker in the, in the, in the next future. Uh, and, the, and the green transition, uh, what, what really poses is to construct or to, to, to do new products and in a different way. And so both things, what they really entail is to uh, develop different tasks. And for that, we really have to reskill. For me, that is the most important and, and challenging thing. And, and one of the things that I think it's really important is that we have to divide uh, the impact on the workforce on two completely different uh, levels of qualifications, which is the high qualified ones and the low qualified ones. Because the things that are uh, in those two segments are completely different in my, in my view. It is true, and the document uh, says, that labor shortage is in ICT occupations, but much more in the low-skilled occupations. And those are the population that we can leave behind if we do not do properly. That is why reskilling these kind of people that are, don't have the required qualifications is so urgent. Um, many times when I you know, work or, or talk with the private sector, they say, okay, then why, why the public sector is so necessary? You know that many enterprises don't like that much interference of the public sector. And it's so important because it is them it is the public sector who really is going to, to, to train those that are less qualified. Uh, for the most qualified ones, uh, probably in the same firm, in the same sector, they can do it, and they will do it. But if we don't do really public uh, policies, uh, those that are being left behind 
will be more, and then the polarization, the social polarization, will increase. So for me, upskilling, reskilling for these new uh, for these new skills or new tasks is the most important one. But the second is demographic change, because when the composition changes and we have less young people and more older people, then tasks and skills of the population change. The new skills that are more aligned with the digitalization are more complementary to young people and, and, and not that much with older people because it's more difficult to learn things that perhaps they are, you know, at a more, at a, at a more distance. So in that sense, this change of configuration first is more aligned to the young, which are scarce. And so we really have to provide this kind of skills to older people, and that is more, more, more um, difficult. And the, the new, uh, and another thing about aging, which I think is very much important, is that uh, they are going to require, we are going <coughs> to require more care. And that means that there is an, an emerging sector that is going to have a lot of activity, which is the care sector. But this care sector has very bad work conditions. And that is another of the drivers that you really, in, in your report, you stress. This working condition is very much re uh, uh, related to this shortage because nobody wants to go there. And then it, that is why it's so important to improve working conditions so that uh, some of these sectors that are emerging are not that bad quality sectors and then people uh, want to go there. Uh, so, for me, these are the three most important ones. Um, and then what I would stress is that migration is one of the drivers. Uh, this would be the last thing I will say uh, in this first uh, um, um, participation. Migration is set as one of the drivers. For me, it's a mitigating uh, driver. So, it is very good. We, if we have lo lo uh, labor shortage, it is very good that we have people coming in. Uh, because what they, they do is re really decrease the excess of demand, which is labor shortage, right? But what it is also true is that we really have to do a lot of effort to reskill this population, which gets us to the first driver. So the four of them are very much related. But for me, migration in itself is going to be an, attenu an attenuating driver. We need them. I don't know whether we want them or not, but we need them. So all those you know, views that want to stop, to stop migration, we have to really think and, and, and be very, um, you know, facing reality is that uh, we need migrants. Uh, they, uh, they are going to enrich our, our, our societies. And what we have to do is that that integration is done in the best way as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Mark, we, we just heard from Sarah that she thinks skills are the most important driver of change, of shortages, sorry. Um, now, the, the, the persistent labor shortages are really found across the scope, uh, not just in, uh, in, in low-skilled jobs, but also at, at higher levels. It's really uh, all across the, uh, the scope. So uh, how do you think that new technologies and, and the green transition uh, will impact those labor and skill shortages in the coming years? Thank you very much, Florence, for that, uh, those questions. Now, of course, I think uh, Sarah is quite right. I mean, we are seeing sort of uh, skill shortages across the board, but driven by different uh, factors. I think what's important is distinguish uh, sort of labor shortages more generally or recruitment difficulties um, from actual skill shortages. Um, sometimes labor recruitment difficulties are simply because employers are unwilling to sort of pay the going market rate. And so, of course, they have difficulties in attracting uh, workers, but that's not really a skill shortage per se. So what we do at the OECD, we have our Skills for Jobs database that use these objective measures of labor market developments for actually distinguishing where there are surpluses and shortages by uh, occupation and industry. And then we can translate that into the actual skill uh, demands and the skill shortages or surpluses uh, behind, behind those occupational shortages. And we, yes, we do find that uh, similar to the Commission and the Employment and Social Development report, there are shortages across the board, but for different reasons. So at the low level, we see shortages, but that is very much linked, as Sarah said, to, um, to poor working conditions often, 
but also, of course, to the recovery from the pandemic. So we see an increased uh, demand uh, for even waiting staff, uh, jobs in tourism, but to some extent that's sort of cyclical and hopefully will level off in, in the future. Where we're seeing structural changes, of course, is in high-level uh, skill demands. And of course, this is closely linked to the ongoing digital revolution, but the AI revolution in particular, which I think a big impact is still to come. As was said in the earlier uh, session, we know that AI actually now has the potential to automate a much wider uh, number of skills. So before digitalization was automating sort of routine cognitive and manual skills, AI now is actually taking over some of those non-routine uh, cognitive skills. So essentially, the AI revolution will really drive up that demand and that upskilling that we see that has been occurring uh, over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 uh, years, and that will continue. But in two ways. So first of all, it will be driving an increase in demand for, for higher level skills because we will need those jobs, those professions to actually uh, incorporate and adopt uh, AI and manage AI. But that's only a small part of the increased demand for higher skills. The AI workforce currently is, is, is very extremely small. I think something we've estimated about 0.3% of the overall labor force. The much bigger impact will be on the skills required to use um, AI tools and applications and interact with those tools. And that will affect many more workers. So I think that's a big impact. We see, however, that there are shortages being reported. And in a recent OECD survey that we did, we saw that 40% of employers in manufacturing and uh, in the finance sector were saying that a lack of skills is holding back their adoption of, uh, I, of AI tools. This, of course, has consequences for the workers. If they are not getting the skills needed to, to work with AI tools, that can actually leave them behind but it also slows down the adoption of uh, AI with a negative impact on productivity increases and growth more generally. We see similar also patterns emerging with um, actually the green transition. Again, what we see, but the evidence is less clear, and this is an area where we need better evidence, is that it's also driving a demand for higher skills, in particular, uh, on average, higher skills than were required in the brown jobs that they are replacing. We also see that it's actually there is a gender bias and that both in green and uh, brown jobs, many more men are concentrated in those jobs uh, than women. And just lastly, just to say that we, I think it's important that we try and anticipate better these changes, both being driven by the AI and the green transitions, we did a report recently on, on what countries are doing to anticipate uh, changes in skill demands as a result of the uh, green transition. We see that actually approaches vary quite differently uh, across countries into how they do this, but I think there are some common sort of findings that emerge. And first of all, we need both quantitative and qualitative information on how we see skill needs uh, changing as a result of that. And I think a second important finding is there is a lot of information out there, but we need to do a better job in disseminating that information to the different stakeholders so that we can actually incorporate that into training content and into career guidance uh, for everybody to help them upskill and reskill as a result of these transitions. Thank you, Mark. Um, before I turn to our other panelists, Sarah, you wanted to intervene. Uh, I wanted to ask something very ah. precisely to Mark because I'm. I'm very worried about how to measure labor shortages, and then uh, we need that. We really uh, have uh, scarcity to measure properly. At ISEAC, you know, we do a lot of quantitative, and then data for us are like gold, right? And then my question to you, Mark, is um, I know that OECD, I think they, they measure labor shortage because of vacancies, right? Okay, it's that, more that complicated is. than that. Okay. Yes, because so 
what we have is we have these objective measures where we look at a very detailed occupational level. We look at how employment is growing relative to the average for the economy, how you know, unemployment is going down, how wages are, are growing, and uh, we use these objective measures to see is there stronger demand in these particular occupations than on average for the economy, or the opposite, weaker demand. And that's how we identify then the occupations that are in either shortage or surplus. Yeah, because the thing is that if we really use vacancies, I'm worried about Spain because we have a lot of very small firms that they don't pose their needs yeah. in, in, in platforms. And then if you go to platform, typical platforms, national or international, you don't find that and then you are missing too much. That's one of the things that really worries me a lot. And if we don't measure a labor shortage properly, we won't be able to address it. Absolutely. So I think that's why we need a more comprehensive measure. And we know that there are problems with uh, vacancy data in terms of coverage. So very important point. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, Maxime, the, uh, the report, uh, and, and Mark mentioned it, the report shows that a large number of companies have, have reported that um, labor shortages, in their view, is one of the main factors that limit production, um, and they also uh, prevent those companies from finding employees with the right skills. And we're back to the skills question. So um, how do you think those shortages have actually impacted businesses over the last couple of years, um, and not only in their production, but maybe also in their long-term strategies? Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to have the opportunity to exchange on the topic. But I want to start by thanking the European Commission and Barbara for making this very good comprehensive overview of the situation and also for this employment and social developments in Europe report, um, which I think is, is a very important tool every year to provide good analysis of labor market dynamics, but the focus on labor and skill shortages this year is very necessary. And for the last year in Business Europe, we've been really raising this issue as a key priority for the European Union together as the Commission, the governments, and the social partners to really work together effectively to address this issue. Um, it was also, of course, a, a positive sign that the, the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in the State of the Union speech um, on the 13th of September raised this as being the key priority for the coming year for the European Commission. And um, I mean, of course, looking at the situation and also the three key words, I want to start by commenting as well on that. Um, the key driver is demographic change. And the key driver is demographic change based on the figures that Barbara has told us. Um, we are going to lose one million persons every year on the working age population. That means the, the worker potential we have. Um, and that is a, a strong acceleration of a trend that has already started, that has affected countries differently, but that is a, a very significant difference because we are speaking about losing 30 million people. Um, so it's a big chunk of the current labor force. Um, and um, of course, skills is a very important trigger as well. Um, and working conditions need to be understood what is at play. Um, but on skills, I think it's, it's a structural issue. We, we've been facing issues around skills for the longer term. The issue is about people's choices of education and training and the available jobs, and ensuring that there is a good correspondence between both. And that, for many years, was never optimal. Um, I think it's very important to work more on that, because we are in the situation of digital and green transitions, and the challenge is exacerbated. But it's a structural challenge. Um, and when it comes to working conditions, of course, um, it depends on sectors. It depends very much on, on the situation um, of the, the, the age groups in the workforce in different sectors as well, and, and the reflection of, of diverse workforce. But I think it is um, important to also have that in our minds. Of course, social partners are best placed to address the working conditions. And so I think in our dialogue between the employers and the workers, but particularly here, the role of collective bargaining in the member states, in the sectors, in the companies is really at play to find the right balance because it is about finding the right way of combining productivity on one side and protection, working conditions that are good for the workers' well-being on the other. Um, 
Having said this, of course, where is the need? So uh, I think we are, um, on the employer side, um, very aware of the impact this has on production already today, but also worried about what it could be for the future if there is no action. And I think this report is good for awareness raising on the analysis on the problem, but what we need to do now is really to act on it. And so. Um, I think it's, of course, a, a very big mix of different um, realities across sectors, but I think we need, on both high level and uh, lower skills levels, people in increasing numbers, and, of course, we need to have the education and training systems responsive to this change. And, and that means that um, a key priority for us is to improve the, the speed, but also the capacity from um, uh, the perspective of quality of education and training systems to be updated in view of the changing jobs markets. So digital green transitions, changing jobs, how do you reflect that in the learning content that is going to be used for people? I want to support Sarah. I think governments play a key role when it comes to the inactive and unemployed people. And not enough is done in this area. We had debates in the last years. Barbara was giving a very comprehensive view of what was done, for example, on minimum income, for example, on, on long-term unemployed. And it's important to work on improving activation of these people, so that is, of course, part of, of the solutions. But we need to combine it with access to skills for these people, because they are participating much less than the workers into skills training. And, of course, they are more distant from the labor market, so the challenge is bigger, but it is a very important part of our success potential to be able to address these needs, these people, where they are in their situations individually, um, and to be able, through the cooperation between the employment services and the social services, to really have a new start uh, for these people to be able to, to return to the labor markets, to contribute, to also have um, a, a positive mindset and appreciation of their place in society. And um, when it comes to, to, to the business reality, I think, of course, we are now doing the best to succeed in the, the, the twin transitions. Um, and um, in order to achieve that, I think today's conference is very good because we are looking into AI on the one side and shortages on the other. We are speaking about people and technology. And the two are very important, um, and there are different panels going more in depth in each of them. But here we're re really speaking about people, and of course it has to do with our prosperity, the future prosperity of Europe. Um, and so, how, how do we make sure this is happening? Of course, it has to do with the productivity of the workforce, and, and that's where the link with skills is important. Um, and in order to, to achieve these productivity gains, um, we need to be better at investing in the technology in the first place, attracting the investments to Europe. And there is a, a key challenge, of course, which is the competitiveness position of Europe that has been deteriorating over the last years, the regulatory burdens for companies that are really a challenge and that need to be reduced. And so we need to focus on the competitiveness agenda that is going to strengthen the position of Europe in the global competition. And perhaps one last word on the global um, level, which is migration. Um, I think migration is an important part of the solution. Um, of course, we need to look at the fact that today, Europe has not been very good at attracting skilled workforce for a long period of time. We had migration, and of course, we need to act uh, responsibly when it comes to welcoming refugees in our societies when they need the, the support of our societies. But having said so, there is a lot of potential to have a much better targeting of our labor migration policy. I think there are good examples in Canada, in Australia, where there is this kind of expression of interest system. I know the OECD has been working on that to a good extent. And we have now this talent pool that is being proposed, mentioned by Barbara, which is very promising. Uh, we welcome this initiative. We think that it will be important to have a good way of looking at our shortage occupations. Of course, the national lists also play a role. It's also about the labor market tests how do we combine our own workforce potential with the incoming migrants? And how do we make it a good solution for all of us, including the workers and their trade unions, so that we are all engaging responsibly for good solutions to our labor market and skills um, shortages challenge? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, Esther, the persistent shortages we've been talking about, whether they're linked to uh, labor or to skills, 
uh, they can have a negative and a positive uh, impact on, on people. So how have they impacted the working conditions and also workers' preferences, including in terms of salaries, uh, over the last couple of years? Uh, so thanks, thanks as well for inviting us to be part of this discussion. My colleague Stefan Grant uh, is our ch chief advisor um, on workers' participation and artificial intelligence. And so we completely agree with you. The two go firmly together. And he's been following uh, the conference. Um, there's three ideas I'd like to uh, uh, put on the table. And Barbara, I just want to, the reason I was anxious to be here is because this is a great report. Uh, we use it all year long. The information is incredibly important and reliable and accurate. So I just want to, to, to congratulate you and your whole team um, on the report. But there's three, three ideas I think would be useful to keep in mind as part of the discussion. The first of those is exactly as your report says, Barbara. The um, pay is part, of the, uh, is part of the story. And our research says that the areas where um, companies are struggling to find workers, you're looking at they're offering 9% less pay. So it's not small bits, it's big bits, big, big amount of money uh, in less pay. So uh, first message I say to, it, to employers is look at your pay uh, package. The second thing uh, we would say to employers is look at your recruitment demands. Because what we have uh, witnessed is unrealistic demands from people to be able to get a job, whether it's discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of a name or where you live, or demands such as you have to have a car, you have to be available to work from 6 in the morning to 12 at night at the whim of the employer, uh, or or the job is very far away from where people live because of very bad town planning in the past. And what we hear workers telling us is that they can't afford to drive to work after Thursday. They actually can't afford to go to work on Friday because of how much it costs them. Or because of the unavailability of public transport. So all of that, all of those things impact on whether companies have labor shortages and whether workers can access jobs. Also the cost of childcare. If you have two children in some member states, it costs more than a mortgage. So, uh, so, so, so all of that has to be part of the, the, the solutions that are, are put forward. The second thing then I'd like to put into uh, the discussion is the way in which some jobs are still being discussed. And it sends me into a very angry mood when I hear jobs such as care and cleaning being discussed as low skill. They're not low skill jobs. They're tough jobs. They're hard jobs. They're literally life and death jobs. And we're still discussing them as low skill jobs. And we're still paying them as if they're easy to do jobs. They're not. They're tough and hard jobs to do. That's why they're hard to fill and because they're badly paid and the conditions are poor. So I think it's absolutely right, Sarah. We need to look at qualification and skill and respect for those jobs. And then the third and final point, because I know that I don't, I don't have much time. I have a lot to say, but the third thing I really want to put into the discussion is that I meet every week with workers and their union representatives who want two things. They want to have participation in anticipation of change. So they want to have a discussion with their employer about what change is coming. And then do you know what they want? They want access to training so that they can succeed. And they can't get it. They can't get the time off or they can't get to the course. So that also needs to be, we can't uh, talk about this as if those, those other enabling frameworks, such as a right to information consultation participation, such as a right to uh, training, that also needs to be part of a discussion, in particular for the medium to, to long-term uh, success. But just to say finally, we believe that Europe can be and should be a great place to live and work and do business. But we need to get all, everything right, not just focus in silos um, on, 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 
on skills as if the rest of it isn't part of the discussion as well. But thank you. Thank you very much. Would any of you like to bounce off on, on somebody else's comments or um, not at this stage, not yet? Okay, so um, Sarah, I'll, I'll come back to you with another question and I'll ask all of you to try and answer that second question in two, three minutes max so that we try and save some time for a Q&A with the audience. We've already got some questions online and I'm sure there are a few in the audience as well. Um, Sarah, the, the report shows also that uh, persistent shortages can be addressed in, uh, in, in, uh, or with different measures, and, and I list some of them. Active labor, labor market policies, upskilling and reskilling, which we've already discussed, like gender equality, uh, working conditions, and migration. So we've, we've touched upon all these uh, uh, potential measures already. Do you see other solutions or other approaches to address those shortages? Can you maybe think of, of other promising or particularly innovative ideas in that field? I think that, of course, upskilling is the most important issue, and then uh, perhaps not, not changing completely, um, I mean, what, what is being proposed, but um, building uh, infrastructures of AI that really meet, match, not only match uh, actual supply and demand, but also that is able to anticipate the needs, really may help a lot. And then in order to do that, we may build these infrastructures, but we have to fill it with very good data, with, with all that information that, that allows to match what is needed and what we have. And, and that is, for me, a challenge. Uh, I think that that is in its infancy. We've seen some examples. I think there are some examples, but we have to do it. All Europe must do that. All regions must do that. All the public en employment service must really embed on that. And then there is something which is crucial in order for that to work, which is that you have people that guide these workers efficiently. And therefore, these have to be people very well prepared. And that's something that we haven't talked that much, but I think it's really important. And the second one that I think that we really need, or at least I, um, perhaps in other countries they, they do more, is we don't have the, the enough collaboration between the public employment services and, 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 and firms. We really need that public employment services consider firms their clients, and then that there is a very fluid communication between the needs and, and what is required. Why do I say that? Something that has to do with what I said before. Firms can, big firms can really uh, train their, employ their employees. There's no problem with that. And they can lead all that, that transition and all that uh, requirements. But very mm, small uh, firms cannot do that. And then that is why they need to go to public employment service and that they do this training to the needs that are required and not to the needs that you can uh, train. Because at least in Spain, we have been training people from the supply side. It is, what can I show, what, what can I teach you? I can teach you this, 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 and that's not required by the market. And I think I'm, I've been doing research on that for more than 30 years, that we've been focusing on, on, on supply, which is workers, for so many years. And then people end up with so many training courses that don't serve for anything. So that has to come to an end. We really have to look at demand. We, uh, I say public, I'm not in the public sector, but <laughs> public employment services have to look at demand and really collaborate with them. And then, for me, the most challenging one is how to get good data for real needs. That's what, for me, is really challenging. Thank you. Well, Mark, to pick up on that particular point and the idea of uh, matching supply and demand, um, in, in the report, we see that there's a <clears throat> limited supply of uh, skilled workers, particularly in the sectors of uh, STEM and, and healthcare, and that, of course, poses very specific um, challenges. So, what type of education and training programs do you consider as the most effective uh, in order to address those persistent shortages? Thank you. Um, 
I think what Sarah has just said is music to my ears in the sense that we need to do a much better job in actually sort of matching sort of what we learn in training and initial education with what is actually needed in terms of skills in, in the labor market. I think that's starting to happen, but more needs to be done. So, of course, this means that if we think about young people in initial education, we need to do a better job in preparing them for the world of work, and that means a better job in looking at what they're learning and how that sort of will help them uh, when they do uh, join the, the workforce. But that's a long-term solution. It will take time for them to enter into the workforce, and there's fewer and fewer of them in our aging societies. So a key requirement, of course, is doing better in terms of the types of training courses and access to that training that we do for adults. So essentially, we've got to make adult learning courses much more responsive, but also inclusive. I think what's important when we think about adults is we need to build stronger recognition of prior learning. So we need to build on the skills that they already have. So it's not about putting them back into the classroom and learning entirely new skills. It's about recognizing what skills they have and then giving appropriate training courses to top up those skills or where they can acquire other skills related to the skills they already have. I think we have a good example of, of the um, Qualifica program in Portugal on that. Again, very important to give adults access to sort of career guidance. So it's not just, again, about the, the training they take, but making sure that that training will be useful and knowing that that training is available. So better career uh, advice for adults is clearly important. Uh, adult career advice has been the poor cousin uh, of, of career guidance because we've focused so much uh, on younger people. And so that's important. Now, here, here, France is actually a good example. They've introduced individual learning accounts. Again, it gives people control over their training decisions, but there's been a plethora of training programs, some that may not be useful, some that uh, w could be particularly useful. And so they've associated uh, an adult career guidance uh, uh, opportunities for, for helping people navigate through that very complex system of training that's out there. Again, I think we need to make training uh, more responsive uh, to changing skill needs. And micro-credentials micro can be that. We can design these micro-credential systems much more rapidly in, in light of changing uh, situations with the AI and, and uh, generative uh, uh, AI systems, for example. And I think, again, that is a, a sort of a relatively new field that's developing, but we have to ensure good quality that those, those micro-credentials are recognized and that the training involved is of good quality. I think here we actually have a, an example from Spain that they are reforming their vocational education and training system and putting more emphasis on the micro-credentials. But this builds upon other uh, areas like uh, in, I think, in Denmark, for example, in Switzerland. They've always had this modular system uh, of qualifications. So again, adults don't have to enroll for the three years to gain a qualification. They can do a short modular course and actually combine them to get a, a, a more important qualification. And lastly, very important, is time constraints. That we know workers are not only facing time constraints at work, they're busy at work, but they also have time constraints in managing uh, their family responsibilities. And so we need courses that take that into account. Again, micro-credentials are important, but we also need those, uh, we need programs that give them more time, for example, training leave. And I think training leave now is becoming an increasingly important policy instrument in many uh, countries. And we see that already exists in Belgium, for example, where full-time uh, employees can get access, particularly if they want to do training in shortage occupations to about 180 hours maximum of training per year. And again, another thing we have to look at. So I'll stop there and just saying, that it's not just about the training courses. We have to make sure that they are adapted to actual labor market skill needs, but it's also the other factors that can contribute to giving access uh, to that training. Thank you. Um, Esther, we've already mentioned several times uh, upskilling and, and reskilling, and we know that these two aspects really help uh, workers prepare for, a, for an evolving uh, labor market. 
Um, and, and that's particularly relevant in view of the uh, twin transition that we have also discussed. So what do you see as a major obstacle uh, to the participation of workers in training? I mean, you mentioned some already in your first intervention, but what policies do you think are needed to help workers participate in those schemes? So back when I was a union official, I would be asked by the union to help in negotiating change. So it could be digital change or whatever the change is. And you come into a room, not unlike this room, with workers like yourselves all sitting there. And uh, you say, we need to get ready. The company uh, is going to make this change. Uh, and throughout the time, there's always been like three things on people's minds. So the first thing is, okay, tell me, tell me about this change. You know, so you have to set out what that change uh, is going to be. Um, and, then, and, then, and then it would be, how do I, how do I fit in? Like, like what, you know, how is that going to impact on me? And what do I need to do to succeed? And then the third thing would be, will I get any help? to do that, or am I on my own? And if training is part of that, will I get, you know, do I have to find the money out of my own pocket? Uh, do, I, do I have to find the time? You know, is the company with me? Is the company going to help me? Or are they going to look towards making redundancies first? Or is it going to be about investing in me and helping me to, to make that, that, that change? And then the third, the, the sort of last thing is they say, okay, you know, you've, you've gone through all of that. And then, and then comes the hardest one, which is everybody kind of gets to it and they're going to say, and why should we trust you to negotiate this for us? Like, why, you know, why, why you? Like, why, why should I trust you in any of this? And the only way you can answer that question is if you have the information given to you by the company. So making sure that there's strong supports for trade unions to have the meetings, to get the information about what the future of that company, that sector, the occupation is, to have a guarantee that you can give to people that they'll get the time off for training and the support. And most importantly, because for a lot of people, education wasn't the best thing in their lives. It was the worst time. And they're afraid now that they'll end up losing their job if they, if, they can't, if they can't pass whatever the new course is. So there has to be strong supports around people and stop doing this all around fear. If you don't do training, then you're going to lose your job. That's, that's, that is the most counterproductive message, and I hear it all the time. It needs to be, we'll help you do the training. We're going to support you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to give you the time off. We're going to, you know, we're, we're going to do everything we can so that you can succeed and the company can succeed. And I think that's the way in which the discussion has to happen. Not, not this fear-based, threat-based stuff. It needs to be a much more participative. The union needs to be involved. They need to get the information. And the workers need to have, we say, a strong foundation. Uh, so that, so that when they engage in it, they can succeed. And then my final thing, so I know, I know you're doing the clock on me, is that they also need to benefit from that success. And that benefit needs to also be in their wage packet. It can't be that they invest all of that and, they, and, 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 and it doesn't come back. All of the profits go to, in dividends, the profits from that change also need to go into the, the pay packets of workers. Thank you, Sarah. I know you want to intervene, but I'll give you the floor afterwards. Um, Maxime, I, I'd like to now look at the point of view of, of companies. What will it take for them to overcome those uh, labor and skill shortages in the future? What kind of policy measures would they need to be able to do so? Thanks a lot, Florence. First, I mean, I think companies invest a lot in their people in terms of skills. Um, 90% of um, the financing of adult learning um, in the form of vocational training is coming from, from the employers. Um, so it's, it's, of course, showing the interest and commitment of employers to their workforce. 
And I, I agree with Esther that there is a converging interest here. So the success of the company is tied with the success of the people in the company. Um, and so I think it's, it's an area of cooperation where we can make um, very good deals at different levels between the employers and the workers to make sure that people participate more, but also that we have the kind of training that are going to strengthen the position of the people and of the company at the same time. Um, and this is collective bargaining. This is what needs to be addressed. Um, I think on, on the policy objective, what we all agree on is that we need to improve and increase the participation of training um, from the, the, the workforce. And, and that is something that, that we need to collaborate on. But on the employer side, there is also this, this part of the debate, which is to the policymakers. I mean, we talked before about the inactive and the unemployed, where the policymakers, public authorities are in the main responsibility. But also when it comes to investing more and having um, more people participating in training, um, of course, there is a financing element here, and we need to look at forms of cooperation between public and private actors, that there are incentives in place, that the companies are incentivized um, to find um, the, the right measures that are feasible for them and that are going to be really improving the skills training uh, of their workforce. And that, I think, is, is why there is a strong tripartite element. And by the way, we were recently in Barcelona at the invitation of the Spanish presidency where we could agree on the tripartite statement, um, which I think needs to be also on the member states level importantly taken forward. Um, when it comes to, to, to some of the issues mentioned from the employer's perspective, recently as part of our activities on, on labor and skill shortages, we've been issuing a survey which is based on the input of around 100 companies um, across Europe, and it included large and small uh, SMEs as part of the, the survey response. And I think one of the key findings there is that not only you've got the, the, the lack of, so what Mark was saying, we need to distinguish between the qualitative and, and the quantitative side, what is really a shortage and what is more uh, qualitative skills issues. And I think it's, it's, it's right. Um, but the shortage is really meaning that there is this element of finding the right people, and there is the element also of, of keeping them, um, because it's a very volatile market at this time. And, um, and so that needs to be, of course, improved by having more people coming into the labor markets. Um, but on the other end, it's also the case that the people, when they get into the job search and that they are entrants on the labor markets because they want to get into a job, often they don't have really the skills that are needed. So there is an element of, of training updates that the companies need to do um, also at the start uh, of the relationship. And of course, this remains then for the retention part, I think. And that's where we get more into the individual responsibility of the workers as well. It is about maintaining employability over the longer term. And so, of course, the challenge of the older part of the, the, the working population is to maintain the motivation to learn and to be able to use the new tools as they develop. Um, and that, of course, there is good potential for that, but we need to work on it collectively and, and with uh, a commitment on all sides to, to do the best we can. Um, and perhaps one last word on, on, on the migration part. Um, I think one of the key facts here is that we have an employment participation of the non-EU populations uh, in our countries in Europe of around 60%. And this is quite low. Um, this is quite low compared to, to the overall employment rate, which is, I think, around 74, 75. Um, so this gap, I think, is also fueling into the political debates. And I think by the cooperation of governments and social partners, we can increase the employment participation of the migrants. And when we do that, politically, there will be more support for the political acceptance of the migrants. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, you wanted to intervene. If I can ask you to do so briefly, Barbara as well. Yes, and then we'd, I'd really like to save some time for questions. Um, yeah, Sarah. I just wanted to, to add something very briefly. And it's, uh, there are some, some AI thinkers in, in, in Spain that have developed a term which is called, I think that it has the translation to English, okay? It is innovation, which means innovate with automation. And that means to go gradually Implement, implementing the, 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 the skills of the population gradually with the, with the acquisition of new mm. capital, mean new machines, new computers, new whatever. Because many, many firms have had the tendency to just, first I build 
I, I buy the new capital, okay, and then what I do? Okay, then first, one possibility, I dismiss many workers that I think that won't be able to update their skills. That has been done. We know thousands of cases, right? And I don't know, but in Spain, if I just tell you about banks, this is like, uh, at least in Spain, that has been really uh, a very, very heavy issue, right? So what they say, and they are, uh, they are really AI thinkers, is you will only innovate if you go gradually, the implementation of capital together with the acquisition of your workers. And then each firm has to do at their pace. Yeah. because it depends on what the skills of the population. But then if you really uh, are, you are successful in incorporating those skills gradually, then you feel so, they feel supported, mm. they feel accompanied, and there, there is where you really get the whole um, benefit from that implementation of, of, of innovations. That's just what I wanted to say. Barbara. Yeah, uh, thanks. So first on this big numbers, I wanted to say that on the one hand we have this demographic change and that's essentially about the labor shortage, you mentioned up to 30 million and so on. And then on the other hand, the problem or the challenge with skilling is it could concern over Everything. 200 yeah. million people who are now active in the labor market. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, the one is just about those that live in retirement and so on, the other means we have to get everybody up to speed. Maybe there are a few jobs that don't change so much in terms of profile, but all the others have to kind of upskill and reskill. So that's why this is also a huge challenge. Uh, I saw a question on the Slido, and I mean, that's also on our mind in light of yesterday, uh, about the impact of artificial intelligence, uh, because it is true in principle, it could mitigate uh, the sort of the shortages by making uh, people more productive. That could mean maybe you need uh, less workers and so on. However, it is not so easy. For instance, we looked at robotization and we saw yesterday some slides. We had similar studies in the park. And in some countries like Germany, you had robotization and even a few extra workers, so job growth. And in other countries, the robotization replaced the workers. So depending on whether you might be a leader and AI, you can create complementary jobs, uh, while in other cases you might uh, lose some. So uh, it's uh, not totally clear. And then just on the education and training, uh, I mean, I, I agree that on also, especially on the lower skill side, there's a need. And what is really a big challenge is that they are less ready for, for skilling. We've had, in the context of this target we have for 2030, that 60% of the uh, adult labor force should be trained every year, and we are only at 37. We are nowhere there. We had discussions with every single member state, and they have statistics about how many of the low skills participate, how many of the higher. And it's the lower skills that really uh, have difficulties to, uh, to participate, to partly get motivated all the time. And I also thought that uh, when Esther said, OK, we have to be part of the solution, I think, indeed, uh, trade unions also have to help uh, yeah. motivate, of course, uh, also um, all the other things that were said about uh, employers or uh, cooperation uh, is all true. So I stop here. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'd like to take uh, one question from the room. We have a couple of questions. Yes, if the, uh, the host uh, can bring the mic to the lady there. And I just, uh, while you're getting the mic, I'd like to raise uh, one of the questions we have received also online, and I'll ask you to answer both uh, in a row. Maybe this one is more for Mark. Um, uh, Barbara has already touched upon it. How can AI and digitalization help mitigate the labor market effects of demographic change? I'll, I'll let you think about this while we listen to the question from the room. Yeah. Thank you very much, Agnieszka Hoindominczak, uh, Warsaw School of Economics. I wanted to comment a bit on what Mark said about training of adults. If you can, sorry, if you can make your comment very short, please. Yes, so uh, when we think about adults, we also need to think that they are different, not only with skills, but also with age. And uh, aging uh, workforce is not only about shrinking, but also the fact that most of the workforce will be 50 plus. So we need to think how to train older workers and older people with skills they need, and they usually have more shortage of skills than 
than normally. And the other thing is the migrant and the training of the migrants and preparation them for the labor market. It's not only about skills, it is also about the language, about the cultural skills. And this is also something that needs to be in the picture if we want to have people that come to us, not only workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, an, another, an actual question from the room that our speakers could pick up on? Not at this stage? Okay, so Mark, maybe would you like to answer the first question about AI? And if you'd like to comment about the point we've just heard? Yeah, so I think they're related. I mean, let's, AI is uh, a tremendous sort of technology in the sense that, you know, we've seen with digital uh, technologies as well. It actually can help us get rid of a lot of those dangerous, dreary sort of uh, jobs. And that's something that we should, of yeah. course, uh, welcome. And they can actually make our lives uh, better. But, of course, there will be people that will lose out as a result. So particularly the, the low skilled that are at greater risk of losing their jobs. Um, and it'll be sort of skill biased. So I think we've got to do two things. One is, of course, uh, we have to help people move out of jobs. We probably will continue to have sort of uh, jobs in, in particularly in sort of service and, and personal uh, care. We need to improve the conditions of those jobs, but also ensure that people can move on uh, from those jobs and acquire uh, the skills to move on from those jobs. So they don't become just dead end jobs. <coughs> It can help us, I think, deal with the demographic challenge, but we've got the skills challenge. So if we can help existing workers in the labor force, so adults acquire those skills to work with the AI tools, they, that can make everybody productive, that can overcome the effects of a declining uh, labor force. But again, we have to tackle some of the other uh, issues, which is, improving labor force participation more generally. So we know a lot of groups are underrepresented in the labor force, so we've got to work on those groups, not just see AI as, as the solution. So mm -hmm. help women with uh, young children remain uh, attached to the labor force, uh, help migrants uh, integrate into the, uh, the labor force. And then particularly for older workers, again, on the skilling side, we have to take account that many of them already have tremendous experience, tremendous skills, but often they're not recognized. They do, do not want to always go back to a classroom uh, situation. So we have to build upon their existing skills and again, have these short skills. And lastly, to say there is also a gender dimension. We often have to train, uh, change attitudes towards training. Sometimes I see that amongst women that have had more precarious careers, they are more, in a sense, open to sort of uh, saying, oh yes, perhaps I can shift to another job, and yep, okay, I need some training to shift to that job. Whereas men in more stable careers are often much more reluctant about thinking about different uh, possi possibilities in terms of jobs, and therefore the training that they require to do those jobs, even if those jobs are relatively close to what they've been doing. So we've also got to uh, tackle attitudes as well. Thank training. you, Mark. So you, you actually answered uh, largely the, uh, another question that we had received online, which was about uh, labor market participation. So thanks for that. Would anybody else like to come in? Uh, yes, Barbara. Yeah, uh, I wanted to comment uh, because there was both a comment on um, migrants and also earlier uh, Maxime mentioned uh, that they still have a low employment rate and I wanted to say there I think there's also a gender dimension uh, also as part of uh, my work uh, uh, in the context of the European semester where we, we look at every member states and what kind of what are the employment rates it's often that women with migrant background I think also in this country by yeah. for example uh, are very low and maybe they accompany their partners or, uh, to come here and then there is indeed a language issue and, and a cultural issue that it is normal in this country or in the EU to work that has to overcome. And I think uh, um, I even remember uh, one of the courses, that's now an experience uh, that was mentioned to me in Germany, where they were trying to take women in a, in a group uh, sort of culture classes then in the street to buy a metro ticket. And uh, then in one case, 
the husband would not allow the wife to go alone uh, on the street. So I think there are indeed huge uh, changes that are also needed to, uh, to, to help with the integration. Uh, and, uh, uh, and indeed, I, I agree that there are still some issues out there in people uh, being against immigration and there maybe we still need more transparency what it needs because who will pay our welfare system if uh, there are fewer and fewer people uh, that work and pay taxes uh, in this context to the extent that uh, sort of our, our labor market is not, uh, you know, elemented also by uh, people from abroad uh, that could cause problems that people don't seem to realize yet. Thank you. Maxime, you wanted to intervene. Yes, please. I wanted to um, add and elaborate a bit on one of the messages that Mark brought on the importance of recognition of skills and qualifications. Um, and on this, I think it's very important to work on this as part of the response to labor and skill shortages, because in the end, it's really about making sure that employers are able to recognize the way in which people have accumulated this experience and the skills related to it. Um, but also, of course, to understand the way in which qualifications are set in different countries and from third countries, um, which is a big challenge more on the administrative side, to understand what is the learning content of different qualifications. Um, and I think in this respect, there is a first step made in the talent pool proposals, which is around the recognition of third country uh, qualifications. But we need to go further, because in order to have a good approach to uh, recognition, we need to start at home. And the reality today is that it's, it's quite difficult within Europe to do that, um, because a lot of um, the, the qualifications, they are national based. Um, and of course, it means that uh, we need to improve the, the visibility and understanding of different qualifications across Europe. But it's also a single market agenda, and it's the reserve for the regulated professions, a directive in place that needs to be better mobilized to favor the mobility of these occupations that are also shortage occupations and that are regulated professions. There can be common training principles for these professions. It has not been used until now, and I think it is important to use it better in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Esther, final comment, a very brief one. So, got good news for Barbara. Trade unions are willing, ready, and have got plans, ideas, and want to be part of that discussion. You can help us, though. Uh -huh. You can make sure that when investment is given to companies, that there's a string attached, and that is you have to negotiate the change with the workers, uh, with their trade unions. So I think that that is a, a, a real change uh, that, that could be made. Just, I just want, just, if I just very, very, very quickly on the AI point and your point about uh, dreary work. So it used to be the case, we say, before AI was able to do, to, to do a lot of things, that in your working day, you'd have, you know, ordinary, uh, mm. monotonous, re mm. repetitive work. And then you'd have to deal with a complaint. And then you'd have ordinary monotonous work. And then you'd have to deal with the high-touch personal stuff. If the content of jobs, all that would say calm time is taken out. Mm. And now you're only dealing with angry people. We are only dealing with complicated cases. I think that's part of, of we could have a whole different conference, which is about burnout and stress at work at the moment. And I think that's, that's part of it, is that the content of work that was the easy bit is now being done by the machine. <laughs> but you're being left with, 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 with much more hard bits, you know. So, so, so I also think that. And then also the other role uh, for, for increasing the working time and age that people will be able to do their work is that when we have the help of a machine to lift, whether you're a nurse or a construction worker or a childcare worker, you won't have worn out your yeah. back by the time you're 40. You'll be able to physically continue to be able to do work. So, 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 so I, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate and fan of AI. I'm not against it. We need it. We need it to make jobs better, and we need it to keep people healthier and safe longer. But we shouldn't only see the plus side. We need to put in... Uh, safeguards about those, um, we say, unintended consequences of changing the content of the of the of the job. 
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to wrap up now, and thank you all for being here. I know you could continue this conversation, but maybe you can do so over lunch. We're now breaking for lunch, and we'll resume at 2 o'clock. Now, I can encourage you again to uh, pick up either print copies of the report that are lying around or have a look at the interactive website. A quick reminder, you can find it if you look for ESDE Review 2023 in any search engine. I won't give you the whole URL, it's a bit, a bit too long, but ESDE Review 2023. Um, thanks very much for joining us for this session. Thank you if you were following us online. As I said, we break uh, for lunch until 2 o'clock, and please, on your way out, do return your interpretation headset. If you had one, you can pick one up again after lunch. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See you later. Thank you.